very strong friend and defender of Luther's views. And so because Luther was out of town when Eck came to Wittenberg, Karlstadt debated him. Karlstadt concerned or, or tried to defend the Wittenberg program, and he came forth not with 95 theses, he came forth with 379 theses, adding another 26 right before the thing could be published. In some of these, Eck was criticized. So the Dominicans continued to press for Luther to be imprisoned or at least severely rebuked and for the heresy proceedings to continue against him in Rome. And again, Luther didn't improve matters for himself. He published a very bold sermon on the power of excommunication who basically said, I don't accept this unquestioned right of the Pope to excommunicate people. Now, the cardinal over this part of Germany, right, you have a whole layer of bureaucratic infrastructure and organization in the Roman Catholic Church, right? So now we're up to the cardinal. And the cardinal of this part of Germany was named Cardinal Caetan. Uh, he was given a command from the office of the Pope to bring Luther to Rome for a heresy trial. But here's the issue. The political environment favored Martin Luther. You see, we ask ourselves a question, why was it different for Luther? Why was it different in his particular political environment? Well, let me see if I can explain it. Frederick the Wise was one of the seven electors of the Holy Roman Empire. He had a critical role in the selection of the emperor, which was due soon. The Pope could not afford to antagonize Frederick the Wise. Therefore, the Pope could not pursue Luther as aggressively as he wanted to because he was protected by Frederick the Wise. You see, to understand this whole situation, you have to understand something about the whole political environment. When Luther was called before Cardinal Caetan and forced to, to um, you know, defend his beliefs and in all this political struggle, he uh, could speak boldly. One of the reasons why was not because he was a, just a brave man and not just because uh, he was a man with very clear theological thinking, but also because Luther knew that he had political backing behind him. In any way, Luther was bidden to a personal interview with Caetan at Augsburg, and he arrived there on October 7th, 1518, with again the promise of safe conduct. The, the discussion moved from indulgences to the relation between faith and sacramental grace. It, it became a much more involved debate about theology and different aspects of the Roman Catholic Church. The bottom line was they told Luther, you have to unconditionally repent of your views. Well, while Luther waited very uneasily, uh, these people thought that he would be taken away in chains. And eventually, he was um, uh, fled from the city. He was sort of uh, escaped out of the city where he had this audience with Cardinal Caetan, and he was able to get back to Wittenberg where he would be safer. This set up a later debate that Luke had with Johann Eck in the city of Leipzig. Now, Eck was a very skillful debater, and he forced Luther into a corner of associating himself with John Huss. You have to admit, that was a very dangerous thing with Luther. If Eck could maneuver in the debate Luther into a corner where Luther stood with Huss, Huss was a condemned heretic of the church. And then he could just say, well, look, you're standing with the condemned heretic of the church. What does that make you? Eck eventually went back to Rome to tell the Pope what had happened in the debate. And when he went to Rome, he went basically as somebody who had beaten Martin Luther in this debate. And so therefore, the Pope issued this papal bull that appeared on June 15th, 1520, and it was called Excurgio Domini. Uh, again, uh, th this great, uh, this is up on the PowerPoint here. This is a, a uh, sort of a promotional thing for this um, disputation with John Eck in 1519. But the Pope um, uh, issued this decree, Bulla contra Martin Luther. This was the front of it, you know, with the whole papal insignia, where he basically said, um, Lord, cast out. And they made specific arguments against 41 articles of Luther's teaching. And this was followed by a formal burning of Luther's writings in Rome.
This was it. Luther was declared to be an official heretic. He was now under the same category and under the same potential danger as John Huss uh, was a hundred years earlier. Luther uh, responded uh, here with his own literature. You know, in this, you take a look at Luther and he's depicted as being this very brave, bold, but very much dressed in his monk's habit, right? Luther considered himself, it wasn't until several years after this that Luther stopped dressing like a monk. He considered himself a loyal monk to the Augustinian order. And and here, uh, from the Babylonian captivity, you know, this is kind of his idea. I'm in my Babylonian captivity, I'm exiled from the true church. But Luther insisted, even though there were very many many attacks made against him, uh, things were published with depictions of him as being a devil with horns, as being a man who had many different heads and so had many different opinions and was therefore unreliable and couldn't be trusted. It was a great propaganda war going back and forth. I mean, both sides used the modern industry of print to as much to as much advantage as they could. So even though Luther was mocked with broadsheets and pamphlets, Eck and the other leaders of of uh, the Roman Catholic Church were shocked to see just how popular Luther had become among the German people. Luther preached more and more in the common language and he wrote more and more in the common language and he genuinely touched the people. Uh, On Luther's part, he issued a series of very defiant tracts against the Pope uh, where he basically um, opposed the Pope and opposed all the power of the Babylonian church. Um, He, well, I mean, we could go through the different doctrinal points that he made, but just basically... He just came out very strong with a series of tracts and pamphlets against the Roman Catholic Church. And on December 10th, 1520, the students there in Wittenberg lit a bonfire before the Elster Gate there in the city of Wittenberg. And they fed the work of these um, uh, uh, papal writers against Luther and they threw in the papal bull. And this is what Luther said uh, when they threw in the papal bull and burning these things in the city of Wittenberg. He said, listen, because you have corrupted God's truth, may God destroy you in this fire. That's what he said to the Pope. Now listen, are you getting a little bit of the feel for Martin Luther and his personality? Luther was the right man at the right time. He was the kind of man that if you backed him into a corner, he became even more dangerous because he was absolutely stubborn, sometimes sinfully stubborn, but he was just so filled with determination and courage that he said, I'm going to see this through to the end. And so when the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church kept pushing against Luther, they were pushing against the wrong guy in this sense because he just pushed back even uh, harder and harder. And in this day, the way that he would, you know, denounce the Pope and sort of send the Pope to hell, it was sort of characteristic of the way that they would speak back then, but it also was characteristic of Luther and the very bold and the very plain way that he would speak. Let me put it to you this way. Martin Luther could not get along in the church today. He just couldn't. People would think that he was too rude, too crude, and he would be too rude and crude for our own day, but in his own day, he was pushing the envelope but not going beyond it. I mean, Luther used to say things like this. You know, if I fart in Wittenberg, the Pope smells it in Rome. I mean, that's the way he would talk. He was just sort of, you know, this. Now, he wasn't that way in his sermons, right? I mean, when he preached the word of God, he, he would speak in a dignified, proper manner. But uh, fortunately, we have preserved for us what's known as Luther's table talk. This is when he would sit around his table with his students and just talk about things and discuss things. And, and believe me, he was a man just given to bold, sort of radical ideas. Now, again... Why would a man like Martin Luther be able to take a papal bull, throw it into a fire at Wittenberg and say, 
Pope, because you've opposed the truth, may you burn in the fires of hell. It's pretty radical, right? I mean, not even John Huss said things like that, right? Well, why was Luther able to get away with it? Again, you have to understand the political structure of Germany at that time. England was pretty much a unified kingdom. France, pretty much a unified kingdom. Spain, pretty much a unified kingdom. But for many different reasons, Germany was a conglomerate of different small principalities where different small princes or lords or whatever, they, they were rarely called kings, but they would be called a prince or a, a magistrate, not a magistrate, a, a, a lord or a graf or whatever term they would use at that time, uh, that would rule over these different territories within the German lands. This meant that you didn't need to get the political protection of the whole Holy Roman Empire, Right? But if your particular leader, particularly here, Frederick the Wise, who ruled over Saxony, if he was sympathetic to the cause of Luther, he could protect Luther within his lands. And because he was more than just one prince among many, he was actually one of the electors. He was one of the ones who actually um, had a role in the selection of the new emperor whenever that needed to happen. He was a guy with more authority, more juice, if you will, and able to exert his authority and truly protect Luther. But you see, this fragmentation of the German map and of the German territories shows you why in this individual area, Luther could be safe in the city of Wittenberg. Frederick the Wise actually had a very critical role in the historical development of the Reformation because without his political protection, Luther could have never really done what he did. Now, I will say this, though. It's not like Frederick the Wise and Luther were friends. Supposedly, they only met once. And, um, you know, we don't know to what extent Frederick the Wise even believed the Reformation doctrines that Luther taught. It may be that his support of Luther was a combination of theological approval and political calculation. But for whatever reason, he protected Luther and enabled the Reformation to gain this essential foothold in the area of Saxony in Germany. There's a particular painting that I like. It shows Frederick the Wise standing in the foreground with Luther and several other of the early reformers, uh, notably um, Philip Melanchthon, also behind him. And it shows Frederick the Wise, you know, prosperous and fat, you know, showing that he's mighty, you know, that he's, you know, he's a man of authority. It shows that he's very well fed. He's got gold chains showing that, you know, he's rich. But what else does he have most notably? He's holding swords. On either side of his body, he has his hand on the hilt of two swords. Do you see the picture here? He's armed, he's powerful, he's wealthy, he's influential, and he protects these leaders of the Reformation. They stand safely behind him. I think it illustrates the whole idea very, very well. So Luther could not have done what he did without having this powerful prince, this elector on his side. Well, as it so happened, if it was up to the emperor, if it was up to the pope, they would have just taken Luther, put him on trial for heresy. They would have done the same thing to him that they did to John Huss. But Frederick the Wise was able to make his case, even though Luther was formally excommunicated, Frederick the Wise was able to make the case that no, you have to give Luther his day in court. Now the same day in court that they promised to John Huss, but they never actually delivered on, Frederick the Wise said, listen, you have to do this. And again, he had enough political power to make this happen. 
it was a very difficult decision for Luther whether or not he would travel from the safe region of Saxony where Wittenberg was and make the journey all the way over to Worms where they were going to have this diet. That's spelled D-I-E-T, just like you, the kind of diet that you eat, except a diet was just a imperial word for the 